you really cannot choose your moments. It's been a life philosophy. That's different than having boundaries about whether you want to do something or should do something. It's when you believe you want to do something, should do something, but believe you can't because it's not sustainable. That's when you should usually say, screw it. It's not going to come around again. Matt Higgins, it is great to have you here on the Learning Leaders Show. Welcome, man. Thanks for having me. Excited to be with you. So I flipped to the back of your book, Burn the Boats, and the acknowledgement section. And there's a lot of people that you mentioned. I'd like to touch on maybe a couple because I think of the important people in my life and the key things I've learned from them, and they've changed the trajectory of my life. So some of these people that I'm going to mention, I think I've done that for you. First, let's start. Stephen Ross. What are a few things you've learned from Stephen Ross and how he's helped you become a more effective leader? By the way, I love that you're, you're asking me about the acknowledgements because that was probably one of the most arduous parts of the book to write. <laughs> and I felt like it was treated as a afterthought, like from the editor, like whatever, just write the acknowledgements. I'm like the acknowledgements, like it's the acknowledgement of everything. And, and my framework going into it when I was having to reassess my life, like how did I get here from a very Buddhist standpoint, like is a book or is a book a tree from which the book came? Like where does the book begin and end? Where does Matt Higgins begin and end? And I began to reassess my life and realize I really, really, it's not that I had mentors, but my life has been like a relay race and I am the baton. And I was handed at these different important legs from one person to the next. And then I was like, what was the condition precedent that made them pass the baton? And the commonality was they believed in me before evidence would suggest they should. Mm -hmm. You know, and what that means, I didn't have the pedigree because I was poor and my clothes were, were ratty or I was too young. And so all these different people who backed me and believed in me from the first time at McDonald's when I was 13, where the owner gave me the job managing McDonald's, the playroom, scraping gum, but still gave me the job. So Stephen Ross. So when I was running uh, the New York Jets, I had everyone's dream job but my own, right? Which is crazy when I say that, but it's just true. I wasn't a big sports fan as a kid growing up. I was just trying to survive. And sports was something to bet on when it was illegal. So I, so that was my thing. But I ended up running the business of the New York Jets. And I always ask, like, okay, how do I leverage what I'm doing today to move me closer to what I really want to be doing tomorrow? And so in the case of the Jets, it was now I have an expertise of running a sports team. Steve Ross had bought the Dolphins, and we were doing the impossible, which was losing money in an NFL team and suffering from blackouts. Like, it was not going well. But Steve is an amazing dynamic guy. He's 83 right now, and you'd think he's 23. It's, like, more courage than I and his pinky than I have in my body. So we partnered up, and the vision was basically – turn the team around, work with me, help oversee the business of it, brought an amazing CEO, Tom Garfinkel, who is best in sports. But at the same time, let's build a consumer portfolio around it. That was the vision. Because when you own a sports team, you get access to every deal flow you want. But because sports are so damn precious and they don't experiment, you got to protect the shield, which I can't stand that language. But I felt like all this deal flow was being wasted when I was at the Jets. And what Steve and I could activate. So we, we we partnered up, created a company called RSC. So he's one of those people that passed the baton. I'm not a Rockefeller. There was no evidence in my background that said that Matt Higgins, the guy who started in government, ran sports teams, would be able to deploy a billion dollars and build this portfolio we built. But he looked beyond my pedigree and look at what I was capable to yet do rather than what I had done and gave me that opportunity. So that's why I call him Uncle Steve in the book. And he's the last person I think in my stream of baton acknowledgements. Thank you for bringing it up. Last point on this, when I did the audio book, which was my first time, and I could get into that, at the end, they were like, okay, we're done. I was like, wait, we're not done. I haven't read the acknowledgements. They go, oh, you don't put the acknowledgements in the audio book. I was like, fuck that. You have to. I'm reading the acknowledgements. And yeah. like. Because my wife, we can get to that, is at the end of the book. And so, yes, you dedicated you know, it to her too. I, there was no dedication at the front. I noticed you left it in the acknowledgments, which is interesting. I wanted to surprise her because she hadn't yeah. read it. She did a whole video surprising me with the unboxing of the book. I was like, oh, yeah, why don't you read the end of the book? And then she got all teary. And I was like, okay, so that's why. Sometimes reading the acknowledgments, I've done it uh, twice now, and we'll do it again soon. It's, it's emotional, man. It can be an emotion, maybe the most emotional part of the whole book. Oh, it's, yeah, for me, that section is everything because yeah. all the people like, but particularly giving a chance to honor my wife, who really there is no book without my wife. So I, I love that we're starting, we're starting here. I've never talked about this section of the book. 
What do you think Steve Ross saw in you? I think Steve saw someone who can see around corners for whatever reason. When we first got together, he had was relatively new to the league. The league is like a glorified version of the United Nations. So everything is scripted down to the chairs. No bullshit. The chairs are moved from meeting to meeting year after year. And every team, it's like somebody called same seats on the bus when we were in camp. <laughs> And like, we can never change it again. So the only reason I'm sitting here talking to you with an incredible consumer portfolio with a guy named Steve Ross is my basic uncle and partner is because for years and years, the Dolphins and the Jets sit next to each other at NFL meetings. Like, and as a result, was able to get to know him. And he's like delightful to be around because he challenges everything that everyone else, just not everyone else, but a lot of people just accept. He's always challenging. Can we do it better? Can we do it different? And like endless pursuit of innovation and creativity. And so I think what he saw in me, in me is a person who had similar DNA, different in lots of ways, but similar, who's just questioning everything and thinking about, can we do it different? Not afraid. So I had a, a mentor early in my career tell me, you're interviewing for your next job every day. It feels like that's what you were doing. And then you got that job because you were sitting next to each other and he saw what you were doing. And it wasn't about the interview, it was about what you actually did every day. For sure, because I actually, I had come to a point when you have such a great job, it's not your destiny. But if you don't leave that job, you'll become so wedded to the prestige of it that you'll never be able to make a change. I hear those people all the time, but who's going to take my call? if I don't have the backing of this brand behind me. And I started feeling that way. I had a office on the 50 yard line at this beautiful practice facility. I'm hanging out with Rex Ryan. I'm traveling on private jets and going to games. And I thought like, this is a hard thing to walk away from, but I walked away from it without having a job lined up. And I just said like, I got a, it was eight years in. And I was like, I need to take a break. Now I had thoughts about what I would do. There was a partner uh, guy I backed named Jesse Darris. He's in a book. I thought I might start a PR firm with him. But like, I knew that my destiny was not to preside over a mature brand. We had built a new stadium. The NFL teams, despite how big they look, they're actually like really big, two hardware stores, like, or maybe like five Home Depots, because the revenue stream that you control at the local level is relatively small in comparison to that, which is sold collectively, which is the media rights and a lot of the marketing. So for me, I knew I had to take a jump. I think the fact that I jumped without a parachute was even more interesting to him. Cause it's like, when we finally connected, he said, well, where, what are you doing? I was like, don't know, man. I have some thoughts. And so that's how it formed. But I like what you're saying. It wasn't like a moment in time. The relationship had formed and and, uh, and it just worked. The second person I want to bring up, and this will, we'll move on after this, but uh, I think most important or maybe tied for most important. You wrote, my mother Linda died with $100 in her bank account, but I inherited the most valuable gift a parent can give a child. Limitless faith in my ability to figure anything out. Tell me about your mom, man. You could probably go on forever about your mom based on everything I've read about her, but that was a, a really cool thing to read. Yeah, what's crazy is until you just said that, I did not realize I wrote that in the acknowledgments. I forgot because just recently I decided to write an article for Today Show talking about how, why when you tell your child that they need a backup plan, when they tell you that the next Taylor Swift, that you're effectively telling them that you think the probability of failure is very high. Yeah. And you also don't trust their capacity to figure out when things don't work out. How is that accretive to your child? And I was saying with my mom, I was thinking back, people presume when you tell your mom that you're going to drop out of school and the, we can get into my crazy path, but that your parents would be the ones to oppose. And I remember maybe this was a degree of cultivating because that's what was necessary. Like I needed to be the hero child in order to take care of our family. But whatever the reason is, like my mother always thought I could literally do anything absurd, including be the president one day. And so whenever I would come up with a radical idea that bended the rules or whatever the, like there was no resistance. So when I told her about my plan to drop out of high school, there was no resistance. Like, like and everyone else said, you're going to be a loser and not in those harsh words, maybe sometimes those harsh words, but my mother was the one who is something to the effect of like, that sounds like a brilliant idea. I'm, I'm sure I'm sure you can do anything. So my mother was um, incredibly smart, whose life was never got any momentum, right? She never got to get momentum because she had grown up in a very abusive situation, the full extent of which I didn't find out until she died many years later. But she just never got off the ground. And so she had extreme obesity, morbid obesity, couldn't, couldn't walk. But then 
went back as an adult with a GED, no, not even a GED. I watched her get a GED, go to college, pursue two master's degrees while cleaning floors on her hands and feet. And virtually she succumbs. We can get into that too. But my mother was, to me, the most important thing I witnessed with her was that there are no guaranteed happy endings. The cavalry is not coming. Like when she died, I remember screaming. Uh, I went and bought flowers and put it on her little chair, which is as far as she could ever get out of the house. And I remember screaming like nobody cared. I didn't get to put this in a book because they were like, this is a business book. I'm like, so business is fucking personal. But anyway, she was. I was screaming. Nobody cared. It was so horrifying that we're a little bit conditioned to think we are guaranteed a happy ending, even if we don't realize it, like things are going to work out. It didn't work out. She died having never gotten an airplane, couldn't fit in an airplane. She died having never driven a car or own a car. And like the idea that this is how it ends. But it also woke me up to like my instincts told me the cavalry wasn't coming and there were no happy endings. And this ended horrifically. And so I I hold that close to drive my paranoia to some extent. How old were you? I was, so I'll, I dropped out of high school when I was 16 so that I could get into college early, right? And get a better paying job. That was the whole hack, born of watching my mother do it. I went to my prom as on the debate team, 3.5 GPA, and the jobs kept compounding. I went from 16 year old high school dropout, 11 years of college and law school at night that by the time I was 26, press secretary to the mayor of New York and the youngest in history, making a hundred grand an hour. This is relevant to the story, 375 at McDonald's to hundred grand one year. I, the purpose of that job was like, finally, I could be a normal person. I never had a girlfriend over, never could hook up with a girl in my own house. Like there are all these distortions. We lived in a dirty, decrepit environment. It was so horrendous, but my vision was okay, let me get enough money so I could do my biblical obligation, take care of my mother, which I'm really resenting at this point because no kid wants to be captive. But let me go ahead, but let me do the right thing because I love her and I want to do the right thing. But let me get my own apartment across the street. That was it. And that was the day. I wake up that morning. She's on an oxygen tank. She tells me like, I don't feel good. I'm like, you never feel good. I haven't slept in a decade. Like you're always in pain. We had, But I was like, we have no money. Like I'm giving you sponge baths. So I was like, I got to go to work. And then 11 o'clock, I get the phone call that she had died. So like she had called an ambulance. It was the last conversation I had with her. And I was actually relieved. I was like, you called an ambulance? Because, yeah, they're going to take me to Long Island Jewish Hospital. And I remember at the mayor's office, hey, do you want somebody to take you? Like, we can get you there very fast. And I was like, no, we have we always go to the hospital. Nothing ever. When you're poor, by the way, the hospital is your general, your primary doctor. You're always, by the way, pretending you have meningitis. I was back then. I always knew the symptoms. Mom was like, all right, so say it's really stick. We would look at the we would look at the <laughs> at the thing. So my job as a kid was to pretend so we wouldn't have to sit there for three hours. But anyway, and then I get there. And by the time I got there, she died. I saw so many things that I now still keep raw because they're so damn important. More important than anything I've accomplished in my life is the simple observation I had when I was a kid is, wow, no one really cares. No one's intervening. And if somebody had intervened, they intervened she would not have died. There was nothing inevitable about my mother's death. She's a product of having no health care and extreme poverty, plus a, li a life of dysfunction where you're a little bit self-sabotaging. My mother also never got her knees replaced either. And I think part of it was being self-destructive. So I've tried, even me telling you this story, even I've told it so many times, I keep it very raw because I don't want to become disassociated from that trauma because in that trauma is the gift of empathy and understanding. I meet somebody who's a single mother trying to raise, take care of their kids. And it's like, I immediately rewind and realize like, wow, you're trying to survive. Your kids are probably rotten. Like we were, you're going to get an education. You know what I mean? Like you probably want a white knight to come around and rescue too, but you just try not to indulge in fantasy. I know everything you're going through. And yeah, here you are still aspiring. So I keep all this very painful and raw so that I never lose that perspective. One of the things that growing up the way you did, one of the things it did for you was it had to develop grit, resilience, an amazing work ethic, a desire to get out of that situation to make money. Now, very wealthy. And as a dad yourself, you want your kids, I would imagine, and we all want our kids to develop those same qualities that you developed, but you live in a completely different situation. How do you help your kids develop grit and resilience and toughness and work ethic 
despite the fact that you're growing up at opposite ends of the spectrum? That's a great question. I, I, I have strong views on this topic because I find when people are born under hard circumstances and they are quote unquote self-made, that a lot of times you become very punitive towards other people, including your mm-hmm. own children. So towards other people, I got to ask this question on our podcast. Hey, Matt, do you like judge those Harvard kids when you get the resumes in and you only look for the, the hard scrabble kid? I was like, not at all. I'll take a Harvard kid all day long because do you know what it took to get to Harvard? And why am I going to pretend that I wish I wasn't born into that kid's family? You know what I mean? Presumably they didn't have a hard luck story, right? Like, why am I going to judge that person? That's number two. It's inauthentic because I've spent my whole life aspiring to be in that position. So I can give it to my kids. Number two, to try to prosthetically install hardship on your children to prove a point undermines the whole reason why you work so hard to get where you are. I'm, I'm trying to end the patterns that govern me. A lot of the patterns that still govern me to now, 28 still struggle with insomnia, still struggle with getting anxiety under control. They were born of that very long period of trauma that doesn't end till I'm 26. Why would I want to visit that upon my children? And then lastly, I don't think it's the it's the relief from struggle that makes somebody soft, because I don't think anybody is relieved of struggle, because most of our struggles are internal. So just because your kids have a degree of material prosperity, they're probably d- dr- they're struggling with their own internal demons, insecurity, or what about being judged for being born on third base? I don't know. So my view of the whole thing is like, the only thing I want to pass on to my kids is a couple of things, is love of work, belief that work will, will let you achieve what you want to achieve, and to believe that work is noble and beautiful. And like, I try to model that utter admiration I have towards anyone I see working in any capacity. And I, it's not bullshit. Like I meet the Uber driver and he's like, yeah, I'm taking classes at Baruch at night. I'm like, man, like, and I try to explain, but my, but my, my kids have the most amazing values where I think people go wrong when they have wealth is when they use the wealth, they send subtle, subtle signals out into the universe, including your children about how your material wealth is equivalent to your station in life. And like, I got the, the nice Daytona and all that, like, that's all bullshit credentials, result of hard work. I teach at Harvard Business School. I'm proud of that. It took me a year of my life to get that course off the ground, the book. So I try to model the product of work and not materialism. And I hate to judge people, but when I see kids who have little shitty values, little snot-nosed little monsters, I usually think it's because the parents are modeling wealth as a value. Hmm. I love the way you're, you're putting that. How old are your kids? I have a lot of them. <laughs> so they're, they range from uh, 15 to 22. I have four okay. of them. Okay. And based on that, modeling the value, like there's honor and hard work. Like this is what happens because of that. What are they into? What are they, what are they all about after seeing you model that behavior? They're all different, but I think, and I owe this to my, I'm remarried, so I have a stepmom, but I think the entire family shares this value. It's no one questions whether they need to work. They must work. And so yeah. everyone has had really menial jobs and is proud of them. You know what I mean? There's no like, why would we have to? No one's doing the math. Do you know what I'm saying? And, yeah. and then everyone relates to stories of excellence wherever it manifests, whether it's the barista or I know it sounds so silly, but like if you have the means tipping, like tipping, like the appreciation for like, man, that's hard what you're doing and rewarding excellence that way. There's little signals sharing the stories. I remember my son and I, these the, again, I say this not as a humble brag because I actually don't feel like when I meet a single mother who's kicking ass at Queens College, I write these scholarships. I feel like I'm around my version of LeBron James. I really feel that way. I much more excited to be with a group of single moms than with some celebrity or whatever because I'm like, I can, I know it. But I remember I was away with my son one time. We were in an island and there was a security guard and he was standing out all night with a thermos. And I was talking to my son about it. I was like, God, can you imagine all night he stands on his feet with a thermos? I was like, let's go find out what he's about. You know what I mean? And then we went out late at night and we just hung out with the guy and he was telling about his son was in the Philippines and he's here because he can make a better wage for them, but he has to stay apart. And he's like, my, my son doesn't understand though what I'm dealing with. And we spent an hour with him and then I went back and gave him something to give to his son. And then I was like, can you send me your resume? Let me, I can, maybe I can find a country closer to you. Like, what not only do I model joy about work and celebrate work, I also show intervention, the power of intervention, what you could do if you could care a little bit. And I think my kids have seen that play out in with a refugee that I met in Italy, 
his family's trying to get to Canada. He, they see it in different contexts. And that's not me trying to like, let me build values in my children. It's like, it's what I admire and get excited about. And therefore they begin to process it through osmosis. Let's go back to when you're 16. Okay. Yep. I just remember being a 16 year old and being a complete idiot. And so I wonder, and only focusing on just being a, a good football player, basketball, baseball, whatever. So you're just thinking completely differently. You're basically trying to survive. You're trying to hack a system. Two parts. One, walk through what you decided. You, you briefly hit on it, but I want you to go a little bit more in depth. What you decided to do, why you decided to do it, and then how in the world you had the foresight to think so far ahead at such a young age when most 16-year-olds do not think that way. Yeah, great questions. Uh, so I, I do think that there's something in the wiring that created a, a high degree of defiance, but not defiance like for the sake of like, you're going to go ahead and drink a 40 in the park, like defiance and like, I'm not going to let this accident of birth born into this dysfunction define me. So I always felt among them, but not of them. I'd hanging out with the with the delinquents and there, there's a lot of kids who died in my neighborhood. And like, there was just this layer of extreme dysfunction, but I always felt of people, among people, but not of them. And for whatever reason, maybe that's my God-given gift. In terms of the the hack, it was just this feeling like this is not my destiny. And I I I also think I was really beaten down. One day I want to write the, the memoir so I can get into the more nuance, but my story isn't simply one of like heroic, my here's the hero boy. It was also one of of dysfunction when you have a parent who's not able to take care of themselves and you as a child become the parent. And I had a subconscious sense of like, this isn't right. And something is slipping away from me. So when I, when you're very desperate and you got nothing else going on for you, like it becomes very easy to make radical choices, right? I, I literally knew what would happen if I stayed the course and where that, where the hack came from was uh, reading an ad in a penny saver. It was what my little free newspaper was called in Queens, New York. And it was, I think it was, I may just be making this up now, but this is how I remember. It was like delivering flyers for a congressman. And it was like an $8 a year job, $8 an hour job. I'm like, wait, I'm making $375 million, five bucks at the deli. What about having this thing called college student suddenly enables me to 2X my income? And then I became obsessed, like, I got to become a college student, but I don't want to spend four years in high school to do it. And because my mother had gotten a GED as an adult, I started thinking, what if I could do that on purpose? And I remember showing up at a college night at school when I was a little kid, being like, hey, if somebody had a GED, could they go to your college? It was like NYU. And back then, and I call in my book, I call this like noblesse oblige. Like, of course, son, we love second chances. And if somebody did well enough on the GED, we would happily, technically, you could convert a GED score. You probably still can to a GPA. And because everybody likes hard luck stories. So I was like, that's it. And I remember excitedly telling my guidance counselor, like, so Mr. Barkin, nice guy. I was like, because uh, he's like, what's happening to you? You, when you were such a good student but when you were in junior high. I said, no, I figured it out. I was like, first of all, I'm working at a deli till you know, three in the morning. So I'm not going to go to Mrs. Graham's English class. But I got a hack. And he was like, man, it's just going to it's going to follow you for the rest of your life. Like you're going to have the stigma of being a high school dropout. And everyone in official met it with that reaction. So that's where burn the boats comes from. When I was going, this is not hindsight bias. This is actually how my mind worked. I didn't have the language to describe it back then. But I realized, how do I get everybody to stop intervening and giving me these speeches that do not apply to me? Like I intuitively, again, realized like, wait, I'm an edge case. Your whole system is set up for the average case, right? Mom and dad, like have a meal, not eating government cheese, not taking a bus an hour away to a to a, an amazing black church to give us free food because we don't want to go to the one near us. My mom didn't because she didn't want to be embarrassed. Like, how is that kid who's giving his mother a sponge bash and is oftentimes thinking about driving his car into a tree? You know what I mean? When I was 16, like, how is that kid going to perform well in this system when there's an alternative? Because he obviously is intelligent enough. We know that he has signs of being relatively intelligent. Like, there was not even an opening for that. And I realized the only way I'm going to get you to stop intervening, stop sending the truant police to pick me up at McDonald's, is if I fail every single class that you now treat me like a piece of trash and treat me like a write-off. It really was the epiphany. And I remember I went from this promising kid in junior high to I would sit in the back of the homeroom with all the kids with the beepers, like re future Rico operations. Like, and, and, and I remember Ms. Vega was so nice to me, the Spanish teacher. There's a point to her too. I'd put my head on the desk in the back saying, oh, man. I was like, I'm tired, Ms. Vega. I was at the deli last night and 
frankly, I watched the Gulf War. I stayed up too late. <laughs> like, and I self-sabotaged and something interesting happened. People stopped trying to to resurrect me and they tried to divert me because they didn't want the statistic of a high school dropout. So if they transferred me to the land of misfit toys, which was this high school auxiliary program, technically I didn't drop out. So that's when I remembered that, wow, self-sabotage is what I owe. Giving myself no retreat, burning the boats is how I was able to make this massive chess move. And so you get your GED at 16 and then get into college at the same age, correct? Yeah, yeah. I mean, not hard. I got my GD and then I uh, got into Queens College probably like three weeks later. Actually, I took the test on standby in Springfield Gardens, Queens, rather than take the class so I could start in September. And then go to law school as well. Yeah. So I went to Queens College seven years a night, which was hard. Lots of I fail everything. Because you're working all day. I'm working all day. I'm very, I'm unhappy. I hate my life. I hate being in the role. A kid, I don't care. Like, where's what was your I, job at the time? What were you doing? I was working. I got multiple jobs, but yep. between, between 16 and by the time I went to law school, I had become a reporter at a newspaper and I had an investigative uh, column called Trib Action Desk. And I would do investigative stories on people's problems. Wow. Okay. So, yeah. And then why go to law school? That is a very good question. The honest answer is I wanted to cleanse the GED. So that when you were talking to me right now, you wouldn't be second guessing whether any of this is true. And I just figured I needed the credentials so I wouldn't have to explain myself. And I thought the best way to do it was a law degree. Now, I also thought maybe I might want to be a lawyer, but it became very clear that was probably not a good use of time. Because by the time I graduated law school, I was already making more money and believe it or not, in the government than I would as a, a lawyer at a top firm. But I went there, frankly, to cleanse my background. What was it's a it very like? Expensive, very expensive piece of wallpaper to cover up my to augment did my. It, did it work? Did it make you feel better? One hundred percent. It was really grueling to go because remember now I'm in law school, and I got I became press secretary going into my last year. I'd be, April of of that year, I was at my third year of law school going to fourth. Now I'm press secretary of the mayor of New York, taking care of my mother during the day. It was an impossible burden. But I also realized I talk about this in a book. You really cannot choose your moments. It's been a life philosophy, even when my instincts, that's different than having boundaries about whether you want to do something or should do something. It's when you believe you want to do something, should do something, but believe you can't because it's not sustainable. That's when you should usually say, screw it. It's not going to come around again. And so that's when I took that job, even though absurd to be the press secretary while taking care of a disabled parent and like going to law school. But a huge job. So this is another example of somebody taking a shot on a young guy, probably didn't have a ton of experience. Again, man, how do you get that job? How do you earn such a, a big time job? The press secretary for the mayor of New York City. Yeah, so, I, so I think another code that I hacked into one was one is just operating all around us, which is compounding, right? That we talk about compounding in the context of money, but we don't talk about compounding in the context of career. The sooner you have professional advancements, which again, could light a fire under you, right? Like, all right, don't do more than two years, quit, go get the next one. Because I was hopscotching so fast, because I was in a race to save my mom, I tapped into the power of compounding at a very young age. Now I drop out of 16, I get a job working at a weekly newspaper, the Queen's Tribune, but then I win all these awards. Then Carl Bernstein from Woodward and Bernstein buys into the newspaper, nominates me for a Pulitzer Prize when I'm 20. And then I got profiled in the Daily News when I'm 21 about my column. So like there's compounding happening. And then I get my first shitty job at the mayor's office where they have me cutting cl newspaper clips at six in the morning and I would deliver them to the staff. Like, here's your clip, sir. But I was a good writer. So they had me writing ghostwriting speeches for Giuliani when I was a kid. And then I was like, well, if I'm good enough to ghostwrite speeches, then I should be good enough to be deputy press secretary. And I want to oversee the police and fire department, the, the press function. They're like, you're 12. I'm like, doesn't matter. So then I quit, which is another important thing. And they brought me back four months later and gave me that job and paid for law school too. And then I quit again <laughs> after a year when I wanted to move further. And then they brought me back as press secretary. So a lot of time, a lot of movement of saying, I'm on the clock and I know my time is now. And I know your reasons for not giving me that job are artificial. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to trust my instincts and I'm going to jump. It feels like you've done a really good job of making yourself indispensable. And I'll take a, a quote from your 2019 commencement speech at Queens College, which pretty cool. They asked you to come back and do that. I watched it uh, again today. It's, it's, I encourage everybody to watch it. Uh, Vanity Fair, in fact, said 
This is a magnificent and truly inspiring speech that everyone should read or watch. If you think commencement speeches are made of cliches, this one will change your mind. Awesome. And, I, and it seems like you got some of the basis for the book from that speech. I'm guessing you, you probably pulled from that speech. But one of the quotes from it, the speech is, make yourself, this is what you said is the most important ingredient to professional success. That's a big line. Make yourself indispensable at whatever task you're doing and you'll always have a job. This feels like something that you, you figured out very early. I did, and I'm glad you're bringing it up because it's a retort to the quiet quitting phenomenon, which I believe it's fraud being perpetuated upon this generation. It's only a byproduct of excess labor and the economy we're in. But yeah, when I was at McDonald's, I always remember I they actually changed the wage labor laws around the time I was doing it because I was only 13 at McDonald's and I was working all the time. But I remember when I was given the task of cleaning gum underneath the tables. And at, I don't know if you remember the little playrooms at McDonald's, they had little mushroom chairs. So it was a perfect repository for gum. It was disgusting. <laughs> but I remember nobody wanted to do that job. And I thought, I was like, I'll do that fucking job. And I was like, and I'll do all, I don't know. I remember gamifying it. Like, I'm going to remove every damn piece of gum. And I would think about the origin of that gum. Then I would watch parents put the gum underneath. And I was like, oh, it's not just kids. Like, I just was like, I'm going to become, I'm going to get a PhD in gum scraping. And because I, I would attack that job as if it was the most important job, I remember when they changed the wage laws, the owner of the place would give me a, a check off the books to go ahead and let me still keep working. And then they gave me the job as like maintenance manager of the party room, probably making 4.30 an hour. And then my new job was to clean chicken McNugget fragments from the crevices of the corners, which I approached with gusto. Now, I'm joking-ish, but because to say, take a, to take a step, I learned so much through that whole fact pattern. First of all, I learned how to recognize when somebody's spotting that you're making yourself indispensable, right? All Anyone here is listening to me who has a staff or a company the word job really just means somebody who's been assigned a problem that you either don't have the time to do or not it's not efficient for you to do or you can't do as well as somebody else, right? That's all a job is. So when you give somebody one of those and it's like, damn, you're so good at it like that I really wouldn't want to use you. My first instinct is to keep making you do it. But then I begin to empathize with your situation in life and feel like that's squandering your talent. Eventually, a new problem will materialize and I'm like... Oh, I have a new problem. Who can I give that to? Mary seems to be doing that one indispensable. This is not that attenuated. I'm going to give her that one. That is the progression. Now, where injustice happens, and I talk about this in a book too, there are certain personality profiles and leaders who, for whatever reason, don't follow that typical progression where you see the look in their eye like, hey, it's a really good job. Like, I want it, I want you to rise because they want to hold you down. They either want to subjugate you. They want to make sure no one else sees you. So I go through these archetypes in the books, but one of them, one of my favorite ones, that's a counterbalance to this is the withholder, who is the manager, who knows that you thrive on praise. Most people do. And they know you deserve it. They actually don't tell you're doing a good job to your face because they want to keep you down, destabilized. But you hear from other people, hey, your boss was saying that you're doing a great job. And you're like, but shit, he never tells me that. And that is the sign of a withholder. So I'm I'm putting that next to the question you just asked about indispensability because you also have to be conscious, like I was, of being like, all right, increased responsibility is a leading indicator of future success and compensation is a lagging in indicator. I'm willing there to let there be a gap between the two. I'll do that extra job and make myself indispensable. But when too much time happens before compensation, I know that you're a withholder or you're taking advantage of me and I'm going to quit. And so whenever I quit, people are like, you're quitting? You're indispensable. You're so nice. I'm like, I know, but I'm aware of my value too. So see you later. You know? That's a fine line. How do you know? How do you manage that? I, I think it actually makes you very peaceful because what a lot of young people do these days, I found, is people get very resentful. Like, I'm not, why did, I'm not doing that job, taking that call after hours. Who do they think I am? It's like, no, it's a leading indicator. Like, do that extra bit of work. Make yourself indispensable. Look, maybe this advice is old fashioned, whatever. I don't believe it is. Like you may, and then set the timeline. I'm going to do this, but at some point there's going to be something I want. I'm going to leverage this incremental effort I'm giving you and making myself indispensable and doing it at an exceptional level beyond the pay you're giving me because I have an eye on the next thing I want. So to make that less abstract, let's say there's someone who's um, doing jobs in marketing and PR but their goal is to run an entire organization, but they have nothing in their job experience where they had P&L responsibility. You're never going to get a job as a PR or marketing person if you never had direct P&L responsibility where you grew revenue. So if you are so damn good at P&R and you're marketing, you're like, 
oh my God, Stacy, like you're so great. You landed that profile in the Times. Thank you so much. Your ultimate job is to take their desire is take their job. There'll be a moment of leveraging your indispensability to go like, hey, thanks for the praise. You know what I really need for my professional development? I just want to I want to handle uh, merchandise sales. It's a small p l but I want to be responsible for that. Yeah, but there's already bills already in that job. I know that. But I really do think I had a good job. And I think it's time for me to be Bill's boss. It's like, and then you do it. And when I was at Lower Manhattan Development Corps, my job, when I ran the rebuilding of the World Trade Center, which we didn't get into, uh, my job was, she was started out as VP of communications. When you're often a press person, you really are helping run the, the government. Like, that's how important press people are. But the title doesn't confer it to you right now. If I had never been other than a press secretary, like, so Matt, what'd you like do? Releases? Or you sat at the podium? Like, you wouldn't know that I'm shaping policy. There was a leverage moment when I was going to leave that job and go work at Disney. And I'll skip the details, but let's say there was a, an interception of that job and that opportunity. And I remember I was like, All right, I'm going to leave anyway, unless I get the promotion to chief operating officer. I want to oversee the operations of this place because I'm doing a lot of it anyway. That simple leverage moment of my indispensability, because uh, I still obviously oversaw press, change the entire trajectory of my life. So anybody listening to this right now who's seduced by the nonsense of quiet quitting, that you could simply just go ahead and phone it in, you're going to be the first person targeted in the downturn. You are. And there's a better way that will feed your soul, which is like, make yourself indispensable, do a great job. And when you don't get what you want, say F you and quit and trust that you will get a, get a better one. But don't choose the path of abdication. It takes a lot of guts and confidence to quit without something else lined up, which I know you know, we, we can burn the boats. The title of your book is right. Not having a plan B about all the science that backs up that statement that how it, it, it lowers or decreases the chances of your primary plan to work. Where have you gained? Cause you started this at a very young age. Now it's easier, right? You've built everything you built. We'll get into some more of the stuff here in a second, but now it's probably easier to be like, you're not paying me what I'm worth or I'm not, it's not, this isn't going the way I want it to go. I'm going to quit. I'm going to leave. But doing that earlier in your career, like if you're talking to somebody who's 26, 27, that's, that seems like a much tougher thing to do than later on in your career after you've had a string of things go really well. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. In fact, as a tactic, I don't think quitting a job before you have the, the next one lined up is a good tactic. I'm actually talking about the willingness to quit the job and to know and 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 have the confidence because what a lot of people do is they fall into a, somewhat of an insidious pattern where they want the company to be almost paternalistic. Like, I have all these unrealized ambitions and I, I need you to satisfy them all within this company because it's very comfy. So I need to now get a promotion to be director and then I need to get a car allowance. Like, whatever your things that matter to you are. And they fail to take a step back and say, it's just not possible in this context. It's a tiny company or that the, it's a family run business. And you could obviously see that their second born is probably going to have that job. Whatever it is, people come up against those realities and they don't accept them. So what I'm I'm only saying is that somewhere in your life, the the willingness to quit must take, must, you know, be front and center, but actually as a tactic to get your next job and having your last one gone is not a great tactic. But big picture, back to the premise of the book when you were saying not having a plan B, I think my premise is less that you shouldn't have a plan B. My premise is that you already have a plan B wired into your factory settings. And we, and by virtue of the fact that we don't accept that, and I'll run you through the risk matrix if it's helpful that I go through, but that's what makes us constantly look back. What the, what the science shows, we tell ourselves that we create a backup plan when we're pursuing our plan A because it's prudent, right? But actually what the science shows is that the, the major reason we conjure a backup plan is to alleviate the psychological pain of yearning, of wanting something so bad that it hurts and you're so afraid it won't work out that it makes you cry that you, you conjure a backup plan to soothe you. But the problem is it's the pain of yearning that makes you able to achieve breakout success. And so to make that a little bit easier to follow, I say to folks, number one, I'm the most paranoid risk taker they ever made. And number two, the reason why I'm able to fully commit is because I run through the simple four-step process, which I'll make very quick. Number one, I always ask myself before I do something bold, what is, I embrace my inner catastrophizer. What's the worst thing that's going to happen if this doesn't work out, right? I want to face the fear, right? And so I, and I surface all the, the absurdity. Number two, if all, if it didn't work out, what would I do to mitigate the fact that I went on all in here? 
what I find when I ask anybody this question within a nanosecond, it's like immeasurable because it's reflexive. They know the soul crushing shitty job they would take when they're, when they don't become the next Taylor Swift. Right. That's my point. Like it doesn't take any time to figure out how you're going to feed yourself. Right. Because that's really what plan B shouldn't be about like a lesser alternative to plan A. It should be like, all right, how am I going to eat? We all know how to eat. And number three is, okay, what's the probability that the, all the things I catastrophize about are likely to happen? That's to challenge the fact that we, the things we imagine that will go wrong never do. And the ones that do, you never imagine, right? We're very bad at anticipating what's going to go wrong. But the probability that you're going to be an outcast or shunned, they're usually reputational about the reasons why you're worried. And then lastly, my fourth part of my process, the most important part, my why. What would I be willing to give up what pain would I be willing to endure in order to achieve my plan A? When I wanted to go all in on Harvard, like I would do anything to stand in that classroom as somebody who went from a high school dropout to a teacher at the top institution. I would have done anything to save my mother's life. You know what I mean? So I don't have to carry this burden my entire life, right? Like when you're, your plan A will will so dramatically eclipse, number one, you're catastrophizing. It's not even close. But why this is so important. We don't go through this exercise of risk processing at the beginning of a journey because we're afraid to scrutinize our dream because we're so happy to have one. Especially when you're, I find when people are in a shitty situation, they're not running to something, they're running from something. That makes them afraid to audit their dream because they think they'll never have another one. So you have this epiphany, like, I got this new business. They don't want to scrutinize because like, oh, but if that doesn't work, I got nothing else. So that's why I always say, you burn the boats for goals, not tactics. Like you always got to ask yourself, I find this a lot when somebody has a failing business and it's like a weird business. And part of me is like, why the hell did you create that business? That, by the way, that was never going to work. But when I say respectfully, can, why did you launch this? They didn't launch it because they wanted to sell widgets. They launched it because they never wanted to have a boss again, because they wanted to leave their kids something. Whatever the, the reason is, like they burn the boats for that goal. When I free them up of that construct, they say, Oh, so my business is just a tactic. You could iterate it, you could kill it, but do not give up your dream of emancipation, of freedom, of autonomy. So, what was so the framing is so damn important because I didn't. I've been able to iterate throughout my entire life because I've been very clear about what the why is, and I've made sure that I'm burning my boats for something very broad that I could iterate within it. You mentioned teaching at Harvard. Another one of the goals. It sounds like you set. I believe I read or watched you were sitting on the couch with one of your sons watching TV and the show Shark Tank was on and I, I felt like there was a conversation being had. Right. Yeah, I could go on that show. Yeah. Can you take us back to that moment and, and what happened and how you were able to actually make it happen? So my kids, I have all these incredible jobs in sports uh, and my son in particular, like he met Dan Marino. He's like, that's cool. And uh, like nothing registers that I do, which I love totally like in their own world. But weirdly, we would watch Shark Tank together and, and we would have fun. We would always make up the worst pitches. We would just like, that was our thing at diners. But we would watch Kevin O'Leary. And I remember one time and he's like, that's like so clever, dad. And I was like, it's such bullshit. Nobody does royalty deals in the real world. And by the way, I'm like, I do just as much as Kevin, if not more. And he's like, yeah. I was like, no, I like, I am a shark in real life. That's like a, a fake shark. And I was like, I'm a shark. I am a shark. I could be a shark. <laughs> and then I, and so like the nascent dream forms, it also was planted in my head by Martha Stewart. I've actually, I don't think I've talked about this in an interview before. Martha Stewart and I were on a panel. We were assessing food ideas for Bloomberg and like in a shark tank thing. And she comes up to me afterwards. She's like, I just got to tell you, you were born to be a shark on shark tank. You were so damn good. And I'm like, really Martha? Like I was like, Martha Stewart said, said I'm good at something. Like I was like, and then, that happened. And then I have this lovely person in my life, my agent named Reed Bergman, who is a shark whisperer. Reed is his name. And he got A-Rod on the show and he got a couple other people. And Reed was like, I was talking about, I was like, Matt, you're going to be on chart. You should be on chart tech. Now there's no like internet application form. So this was a year of my life. I love when people tell me like, Oh, they just called me. I'm like, yeah, you didn't put any work to get on shark tank. Cause everybody's just waiting around for you to be a shark. But anyway, I tell you the truth. <laughs> like, I was like, this would be amazing. I go out to LA. They give me like the bullshit courtesy meeting for like 15 minutes on the side. Never been to a set before in, L in LA. And I meet with the executive producer named Clay. And it was supposed to be 15 minutes. And as I'm telling the story of that, I'm telling you now, he sat for another 15 minutes and he sat for another half an hour and he became another baton carrier. He was mm -hmm. like, you have something we don't have on the show. Damon has it that to an extent. You have a different, obviously, background. But we have a, a real New Yorker who's come from nothing. That would be valuable. And it took a year. And then they ended up, in the end, they weren't going to 
um, actually have me. I got the call like, hey, we just don't have enough. They created two extra episodes to put me on. And I got the call that I'm going to be a shark on Shark Tank. What do you think it was, again, <laughs> that set you apart? Because everybody wants that job. Like yeah. you said, they'll act like, oh, they just called me. But everybody wants that. It's just, it's like the coolest show on TV. Right, exactly. Uh, everybody wants it. What do you think it was? The story is compelling, but there are a lot of great stories out yeah. there. What was it? I, I think it's probably a combination of the story being compelling, having the credential, but the fact that no matter what I do in life, whatever I achieve, I don't change. And I, I think there's a degree of accessibility to me that I'm proud of and I'm not trying, you know what I'm saying? And so I think that's appealing, right? Like there's an, uh, I think an every man quality about me that I retain and, but I don't really know. I was probably, what, was it, what were you feeling the mm -hmm. moment? Because you had not been on TV prior to then, right? This is your first time. So what, what are you feeling like the night before, the morning of the, you're getting ready to go on TV and, and Mark Cuban and these famous guys that you've been watching with your family and all of a sudden you're right there. What is that like? Yeah, I so I hear I have this incredible opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm completely freaked out and stressed about it. And I debated a lot. It's tough because if you saw me on the show, you would believe that I was a natural for sure is and you would say that was an effortless performance and so i had to do a lot of soul searching of like am i going to share the truth but then i thought i'm doing a disservice to anybody who believes they don't have what it takes i'm not practicing what i preach if i don't tell you the truth right because you'd be like oh, i'm not that good night before i don't sleep the night before I, i'm a terrible insomniac and i'm like all right i'm gonna i, I have to sleep I go and do a whole routine i work out i go to bed and then it's five in the morning, my, my alarm goes off and my wife turns to me and she's like, all right, baby, like you ready to do this? And I was like, no, I didn't sleep all night. I was like, I took two Ambien and I still didn't sleep. So like two Ambien up for 48 hours. And I'm like, how am I going to go on Shark Tape? None of this is an exaggeration. I had conjured in the middle of the night while she was sleeping. And I'm like, you know how you beg with the, your maker? Like, please, Lord, like, let me sleep. Like, why are you doing this? And then you hate yourself because you're like so pathetic. You don't sleep. So I tell my wife, I was like, all right, I figured it out. I'm going to say that we ordered salmon for room service. And there's a guy, Rohan, who lives down the block. I know he's local because Reed told me I'm going to help fill in and I'll say that I'm sick. And she's like, okay, honey, well, why don't you go in the shower for a little bit? And she's so great. She's like, okay, that's a good plan, but maybe take a minute. And I remember I was in the shower. And again, all, all true and embarrassing. And I was like, wow, I architected my entire life, scrapped my way out of dirt, watched my mother die. Everything's been hard. Why wouldn't this be hard too? I don't know why this is hard for me and why I find this an anxious moment, but I do. And I was like, I got to get something to get through this, but I cannot be defeated before I even get in the arena. And then I, that's when I occurred to me that Eminem would get me through this. Again, true story. I go out to my wife and I'm like, babe, I got it. I'm going to listen to Lose Yourself on a Loop for the next three hours. And she's like, oh, okay, hon, that's perfect. Let's get dressed. <laughs> There's a video of me in the car. I have it up. Mom's spaghetti, nervous already, like for three hours. All that being said, I still go and I tell Damon, because I figure he's the one I could be honest with. I was like, Damon, like, what advice do you have? Because I'm definitely freaking out. And he gives me the greatest piece of advice on imposter syndrome. I know I've given interviews about this, but anybody out there listening has got anxiety. Number one, let me tell you, anybody who tells you they don't have it at the top is lying to you because they want to act like they're self-possessed. It's not true. But number two, no one gives you permission to be at the table. There's no final arbiter of belonging in society. What Damon said, is like Socrates on the mount. He says, you belong here because you are here. And I just love the that it is true. At the end of the day, you must validate yourself. So when I went on the show, I had a moment of nervousness, frozen. And then I remembered I've been here. I belong here because I am here. I've done more deals or as many deals as anybody on this. I have what it takes. And after the first two minutes, the next eight hours were the best of my life. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. I was competing against Mark Cuban and Kevin O'Leary in the first section. And I hate when they do the whole like, all right, you better give me an answer. I was like, ah, there's another way. And I remember talking to the entrepreneur. I was like, no, don't look over there. Stay with me. Stay right here. I was like, this is how life is going to go. Of course, that deal didn't work out. But I said, like, I painted a picture of partnership rather than one of intimidation, which is why I was, I was trying to stand out. That's a long way to tell the reason why I'm telling everybody this story. I get asked this question a lot because I talk about how self-awareness is the greatest arbitrage within ourselves personally and professionally. And people ask, Matt, how do you cultivate self-awareness and leaders? How do you cultivate it? And I gave a talk to a 100 CEOs one day, and I was like, what am I going to tell them? And I tell them the story of what I just told you about Shark Tank, and then I show them the video. 
And then I said, okay, now you saw that video, right? I did great, right? And everyone's like, yeah, you kicked ass. And I was like, but if I let you believe that's how I was, I, that's a useless illustration of me, right? But if I tell you how I was really feeling, I've now just modeled what self-awareness looks like in this room. I've created space for vulnerability. So when you share your vulnerability with your team in the world, you give them permission to look within, share what they're dealing with. And so it's the reason why I'm so passionate about sharing that story, because it is a little embarrassing and it's something humans go through. And by the way, I performed well anyway. So that's how you create cultures of, of self-awareness is by modeling vulnerability. When you are in the position to hire leaders, I, I work with a lot of people who are trying to get promoted, trying to get big jobs. What are some of the must-haves? Like f when Matt Higgins is like, okay, they're going to have a big-time role within one of my companies or with something that I'm doing. What are some of those must-have qualities in a person to, to get a leadership role for you? That's a great question. So let me separate the act of investing because investing, I think a lot is about issue spotting the derailers and yeah. trying to ask you to say, are those fatal? Are we likely to, can we work around them? Can we mitigate them? And does the person have what it takes? So on the invested front, I'm always looking for somebody who over-indexes on a combination of confidence and humility. People yeah. think those are in opposition. They're actually inextricably linked. When you have confidence, you're willing to look within, question your own decision-making. When you have humility, you're willing to acknowledge it and kill your own bad ideas. And it doesn't destroy your self-esteem because the most successful leaders are ones who make a series of pivots. I always say being the leader of an organization is really the CPO, the chief pivot officer. And so you have to be willing to pivot, right? That's on the investment front. When I'm dealing with somebody who uh, who's going to be a leader, right? I, obviously the the intelligence and, but I'm looking for a degree, a high degree of empathy. I'm looking for a, a person who, when you meet them, makes you think and say to yourself, I don't know how they'll do it, but they'll just figure it out. I'm looking for somebody that when I walk away, like, oh, they'll just figure it out. I'm looking for people who look to plug holes rather than poke at holes. When they see a hole in somebody's composition or a problem, they're like, oh, let me fill that in for you. Otherwise known as servant leadership, but I don't like that cliche. So I say plug holes, right? Whereas those, some people look to poke at people because they're under, they're insecure. So it's a constellation of attributes, but those are the, really the, if I had to pick one, as you said, assuming intelligence, it's the person that will just figure it out because that scales really well. Then I don't have to intervene. I don't have to, I'm always looking for efficiency at scale and self-awareness scales great because they make their own interventions. You don't have to. And somebody that you say they just figure it out is great because they iterate on their own without you having to do the work. How can you tell that in the interview process? If they got that, ah, oh, they'll just figure it out. How do you tell if they have that quality? I think it's usually case studies, their eyes twinkle. And I'm like, tell me a situation. I, I ask this question a lot. Tell me a situation when you were really desperate and you wanted to quit and you thought all was lost and you figured your way out of it. Now that's a hard one, right? People are like, oh, put me on. I said, I'm going to give you a little bit of time that we can return to it at the end of this. So in breaks, when you're zoning out about what I'm saying, think about that question. <laughs> but, I, but I do. I said, show me something where you were desperate. You thought all was lost. You just figured out. I can offer you a hundred examples of that. So now I'm not holding you to that standard, but if you can't conjure a very compelling one, then you're not that person. In a way, do you really value that because that's a part of your story? Probably, but yeah. I honestly think I value it because it re I'm looking for efficiency of scale. Yeah. I'm, look, I'm trying to, because I'd say a decade ago, and I still do this, because I think I have a, I'm pretty good at working my way out of bad situations. I put myself in them, and actually, that one doesn't value your your worth enough, right? As life gets older, you have more success. You should be looking for situations that are. No one gets a clean shot on goal, but it'd be nice to get the closest to it. I, I never had a lottery ticket, but I, I would love one. So I'm trying to not put myself in situations where, you know, I have to do the work, and so I'm always trying to scale. And I think when somebody has what that intangible just figured out. It's amazing because that here's why that matters so much. Then whatever it is job I'm assigning them to do, or if in the case of a leader of a business and I have skepticism that the business will really be a big business, then if I if I if that person gives me that feeling, then I don't have to worry so much that their model is 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 off. Right now, let's do the opposite. Let's say that the per person under indexes for self awareness, and they're not the kind of person that you say will just figure it out. So that means in lieu of just figure it out, you're probably a little bit of a blamer. You might be a catastrophizer. 
right? You might stare at an Excel sheet paralyzed, right? You don't have a kind of, you're probably under indexed for optimism, right? You're a little pessimistic. So if just think about the opposite of the person that you say, we'll just figure it out. Now, if you also under index for self-awareness, now it's going to take multiple interventions to get you like, no, the iceberg is like really the Bob was out there. He's on the deck. Like he sees his fog everywhere. <laughs> We're totally doomed. I want somebody who can steer the ship on a degree of evidence that the iceberg is there without having to see it. And so I just always imagine the opposite of those two skills and how bad that is in a leader. One more. You're meeting with somebody who's 25 and they did graduate college and they want to leave a dent in the world. They're inspired by you and your story. They don't necessarily know what they want to do, but they do want to have that type of impact. What are some general pieces of life slash career advice you'd give to that person? I think, first of all, there's so much pressure on people. They think they need to figure out the the end point and that we don't meditate more on um, these more existential questions. For example, are you a creator or, or are you someone who likes to implement someone else's vision? Just what resonates for? Are you, do you enjoy being part of a team or do you enjoy working in isolation? Are you intrinsically motivated or do you need somebody else to set the goal for you? Do you panic when you don't have feedback? or you can actually run off on your own? Do you imagine yourself in a lateral environment in an office? So these questions that I find, and the reason why they're, they're important is because you just need to make the next best decision that moves you in the general direction of your ultimate ambition. A lot to swallow, but so what does that mean? I know my ultimate ambition is that I wanna be a creator and I really wanna invent something, but I don't have my idea yet. But I really love being somebody who starts from scratch. I thrive in chaotic environments, like, okay. so. How do we make the next best decision that moves you in that general direction without having you to know exactly where you're going to land? And I think young people, because they're not given that mentorship on tra on trajectory, they are like, I, I got to like find the thing. Although this generation is different. They're doing more like high side hustles. And I think probably maybe over-indexing on quality of life and feeling and environment. But that's my advice to somebody is like, just have a general sense of the kinds of life you want in the environment you want to work in and then make a great decision that moves you closer. And as long as you can connect the dots to that thing, even if it's a little bit meandering, then it's a good decision, right? And I'm just always trying to lower the bar a bit. I love it, man. The book that I highly recommend, it's called Burn the Boats. We've been referencing parts of it. We probably hit like 7% of it, so there's still plenty more to go get. So I encourage people to check that out. And Matt, this has been a thrill, man, and a big fan of your work, have been for a long time, and I certainly would love to continue our dialogue as we both progress, man. No, thank you. And I, the last word to people listening, the book is a bit of a Trojan horse. I deliberately tried to appropriate a phrase that goes back to the beginning of, of recorded history. It's like an inside joke, maybe too clever. Watch the book, doesn't it disappears in a year. But I'll tell you what I was thinking is that I wrote this book for the percentage of the population, which I think is the majority that often self-selects out of ambition because they use the words to describe themselves, I'm not a risk taker, or somebody has boxed them in, or they box themselves in. Whereas while not everyone is a born risk taker, everyone is a born risk wanter because on the other side of risk is reward. I wrote the book and kind of an inside joke, taking this militaristic, bombastic, jingoistic phrase from a military context, and I'm bringing it forward for the rest of us who have anxiety, who deal with imposter syndrome, who came from effed up circumstances, and to say, no, it's our turn too. But here's a process for you to use to increase your tolerance for risk so that you can increase exponentially the reward you gain out of this life. So anybody who sees that cover and be like, oh, that's not for me. I could never do that. It's actually not that book. It's the opposite of that book. It's a little bit of an inside joke because what I want to do is birth a whole generation of boat burners who said, wait a minute, just because no one ever said I was great or I had this situation or I have anxiety didn't mean I didn't, I couldn't go for it. I just didn't have somebody to hold up a mirror to me and say, this is my potential. And this is a path. And so the reason why I pull back the curtain on so many vulnerable moments is not because I think I'm inherently interesting or truly honestly care. It's because if I show you that I was able to do it in spite of, you will meet me somewhere in that journey, either as the kid with the government cheese, wherever I was, and you will see yourself and you will believe that you can burn the boats too, even if you weren't born what you call yourself a risk taker. Thanks Thank again, you. man, for doing this. I, right, I loved it. And I, I definitely would love to have a round two, man. No, amazing backdrops, by the way. Both of you, if you're listening, <laughs> make sure you see the video. Look at the have your guy take the picture. No, <laughs> awesome.
We didn't even plan it. Awesome podcast. Thank you for having me. Burn the boats, everybody. Thank you, man.